my name's Ken Dodd. I'm the county conservationist. Uh, for those that didn't meet me at the first meeting, um, I'm going to go through just a few quick little things on uh, Zoom so we can uh, make it better for everyone here. On the bottom left corner of your screen, there's a little uh, microphone that says mute. That, that's to mute your stuff. We ask that everyone mutes when they're not talking so we don't get background interruptions. Right next to it is a camera that says stop video. You click on that, it turns off your camera that we can't see you. Um, you'll still be able to see us, see everything and so on. Um, basically they say if you got bad internet that uh, you don't have very good streaming, you can turn that off and it'll, it'll help you out usually. Um, then if you scroll across down on the bottom there, you can see participants. We got 15. And right next to it is chat. If you click on that, you can take and text in there. Um, it's like texting or sending an email, and that'll go out to the group. And if you have questions at any time, type them in there, and we will make sure that uh, the participants here uh, all hear that question before this is over. That so, um, And don't be afraid to jump in when it's an opportune time when one of the presenters are talking. The other thing I'm going to do is just quickly go through on how to find all this information about your plan and your lake. Uh, Ryan, you, can you see my screen there? I can, yep. Okay, this is the homepage uh, of Oconto County's website. Um, I'm going to show you how to get in here, and this is where all the information for your lake and all the other lakes that we're doing is going to be kept. You go on the top tabs here and you see departments. Uh, you click on that. You drop down to the land and water conservation, click on that, you go on the left-hand side here, and you see the county waterways and aquatic invasive species. And here you got uh, four main categories, invasive species information, healthy waters cost share program, the county-wide lake study, which is the main one where all the data is kept, and then the county cost share program underneath that. And that's a program that uh, we help individual landowners with erosion problems and shoreline restoration and stuff. We're going to click into the countywide lake study. Here you're going to find all the information. Um, you can read this stuff after, but the first one's kind of our county plan. Um, a countywide survey is the next one. Then we have the individual lake summary reports and plans. Um, this is where all your information will be. So if you click on that and go in there, all the lakes are listed here. We will go down Star Lake, and you see right there the Star Lake summary report. Stuff that Ryan's gonna to present tonight, the summary, that's the exact same report. Once he starts to plan, if you go up a few to Ross Lake, you can see they've got a final lake management plan in there. Um, some of them have draft, yours is gonna start out to be draft. That'll be listed right next to this lake summary at the same time. So um, basically all the information is right there. I'm gonna back up just one page quick here. The other thing we ask, uh, we mentioned before and on the bottom here is the individual lake surveys. We ask that if you haven't taken this survey already, you just go down to Star Lake or any lake around your area that you, you utilize. You don't have to be a resident on the lake. And we ask that you take that survey. That gets incorporated into your plan. If you have two, three members in your household, every, every individual can take it. It's not just one per household. So we ask if you haven't take that, taken that yet um, to go ahead and do so because that'll be incorporated in. And with that, I am going to switch this over to Dale Moore from UW Extension to give you a quick little history on how we got here. I think everybody can see the slide. I forgot to reset it. Anyway, uh, good evening. I'm Dale Moore with the University of uh, Madison Extension. And uh, I, I just want to let you know that even tonight, even though tonight we're talking about your lake and the uh, lake management plan for your lake, um, I, I just want to say that uh, the, it, it, this is a bigger project than just one lake. And uh, um, as I go through the history, you'll see where we're coming from here. And uh, even though you're, you're interested in your lake, you may have an interest in all water bodies within O'Connell. And we, we weren't really sure of that. Uh, but we just want to let you know that uh, we're capturing everything that we do as we go along. Um, Ken identified that website. Uh, the postcard that you received uh, in the last couple of weeks notifying you of this meeting gives you a shortcut to that website as well. 
So if you were to go at that postcard and look for that shortcut, you it will take you uh, directly to that link uh, without going through all those additional steps. Just be aware that if you type in that shortcut, it is case sensitive. So if it's a small Z, make sure you put a small Z in it. So with that, a little bit about our history. Ocado County is a big county. Much of uh, northern Wisconsin is. We're over 80 some miles away from the courthouse where all of our supervisors are. There's 31 supervisors. In the uh, northwest, that big pink area that I have, that, that's where most of our lakes exist within the county. You can see we're almost the furthest reach from the county seat. We have three supervisors there out of 31. And uh, with that, um, we have most of our workforce leaves the county every day to go and find jobs, work a job, and then come back. So really this slide just talks a little bit about all the different um, uh, uh, issues that are out there that compete with making water issues a concern in the county. Uh, now, Ken and I, as well as the rest of the uh, staff that are on tonight, we uh, think very highly of the water, as do you, uh, but it's it not necessarily uh, at the top of the rung for many agencies that are out there. Um, within the county, we have the top three agencies that tend to get the most attention. That tends to be the Sheriff's Department, the Highway Department, and Health and Human Services. Water-related issues are really not there as a few years ago, but we're making uh, um, great progress in getting that to be uh, well known within our county. So going back a few years ago, uh, Ken and I, we brought together a small group of people, uh, agribusinesses, farmers, dairy, uh, sports folks along rivers, along lakes. Uh, those are in the energy sector uh, uh, for dams. Um, and we were asking them what the concerns were. And Ken's office has to do this once every five years. And with this plan, they look out for a 10-year cycle. And once Ken and I uh, sat down with this group over three nights, evenings, uh, we identified so many topics that we just knew that we weren't going to be able, to, with our limited staff, be able to do this ourselves. So we were trying to figure out what's the best way that we could go through this. So we asked the group, what is uh, the, the parting uh, call to action statement that they would like uh, to leave us with? And they designed that they would like to have the healthiest waters within Wisconsin. And basically, we took that and we ran with it because when, when Ken and I left those meetings, we were quite frustrated because there was no way four people, my support staff and I and Ken and his uh, support staff, were going to be able to accomplish everybody's wish list that was there. So we decided that if we could really focus on this slide where we have a slide on getting other people in on our timeline, making O'Connell County a priority, we would be able to do that. So with that, um, oh, I see Sarah, were you holding up a sign for me? No? Okay, sorry about that. So with that, we were looking at uh, identifying a team. Then we were uh, looking at uh, trying to uh, get more awareness, whether it's at the county, at the state level, about the importance of waterways and water within O'Connell County, uh, not only to the taxpayer, but the user as well then try to figure out how we're going to piecemeal uh, into a very systematic approach on dealing with water issues. So really, as far as the uh, getting uh, many hands involved, today we do have the staff uh, from Land Conservation, UW Extension, uh, but we also have the DNR uh, water biologists as well as the fisheries. Uh, we have the, the, the scientists from UW uh, Stevens Point. Uh, we have the lake associations, we have districts as well as groups. We have the volunteers. We also have the umbrella organization called OCLALA, Ocano County Lakes and Waterways Association. And then of course, uh, a brand new citizen advisory group. So those are the, uh, in a sense, the many hands that were created to uh, try to tackle this big issue um, as we move forward and not just have a small body working on this. The next thing is about awareness. Awareness is uh, once we develop information, we need to get it out there. Uh, but once it's out there, we don't want it to be forgotten. So we created a website to house most of the information uh, that uh, Ken just went through. We also took that information and we had many of the um, lake owners uh, or lake property owners uh, come before the county board to present their issues and concerns to try to raise that concern. They've done that at least two years 
uh, now. And um, the county uh, was such had such a response to that um, in a positive light that they dedicated two hundred thirty uh, uh, two hundred thirty thousand uh, dollars to the process to help with grants and that sort of thing. So you can see that we're we're slowly making headway into uh, bringing lakeish issues and water issues uh, to the forefront with the county. Now it's not two hundred thirty million dollars, but it is a start. Uh, especially when we can use that money to help offset some of the uh, grants that are going forward. Uh, let's see, um, we were also able to conduct a 400-person uh, survey where we identified a lot of key concerns of those that use the water, those that are in a tourism. And with those concerns, let's say it's no wake, uh, others talk about pollution, others could be runoff and salt in the water. We took those concerns to each of the county departments Sheriff's Department, Highway Department, Health and Human Services, Park and Rec, Zoning Office, Land Use Office, and we asked those department heads, what can they change or do to help address those concerns? They identified a number of steps that they could each do to address those concerns, and we drafted that into an operational guide. So again, here we're taking some key information. We brought it to people who could actually make a difference and then we developed a document and then we got it ratified in a sense by having the county board unanimously adopt it. So that's out there. It's for you to read um, and it's on the website. And again, that's part of our getting uh, awareness through listening, discussing and presenting and getting actions. Um, as far as tackling the waterways, we have over 300 lakes within the county, uh, over 270 are named. And we were trying to figure out how do we how do we deal with this? Do we try to do a, a baseline analysis of all 300? Well, that just isn't going to happen. Um, we did look at uh, at the beginning of this is saying, well, what about the lakes that have public access, whether it's town um, or, or federally owned or uh, or county owned? And we came up with 60 lakes that have that sort of access, and we identified those as being the most at risk uh, lakes. So then the idea is, do we attack, uh, basically do a, a study of all 60 at one time? There were counties that tried to do, I think, 30 at one time. And it could become such a nightmare in try, trying to get staff and people out there that we identified that we could probably do six or seven lakes at any given year uh, because it's going to be a two-year cycle. So that's what we decided to do, the 60 lakes. Yours is one of the lakes that has public access and that was identified earlier on. We're about halfway through the 60 right now, or about 30 uh, uh, lakes that are done. Now to try to keep people interested and understand about this process, we do a update uh, document that's on the website as well. It can be mailed to you. It, it goes to the lake associations in the districts. And we also get out to the local officials at the town level but this is a, a copy of the first page. And really it's a snapshot for people to give out to their neighbors so people could understand this entire process. We don't want people to forget while we're, why we're doing the process and where they can find information. So even though the pages to the right here are harder to see, uh, the last pages have copies of the documents that they can go and look and find. They can print it off, or if they wanted to, they could contact my office or Ken's office, and we'll print a copy for you and we'll mail it out to you. But anyway, this gets uh, basically published uh, twice a year. It talks about where we're at on each of the lakes as they go. So anyway, uh, that's out there. And um, again, to find that, you go to where Ken directed you to the, uh, the website, where I have it circled, that's where you would go and you would click on it and you would have that document on updates. So really that's it in a nutshell for history. Um, I guess I'll just turn it over to either it's gonna be Ryan at this time or Chip, uh, but if there's no questions, I could turn it over to whoever raises their hand first. Ryan, is that you? <laughs> All right, I see a hand being raised. I'll raise my hand. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Dale. Um, so my name is Ryan Haney. I'm with the uh, University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point um, here with my colleague Sarah. And uh, as Dale mentioned, we also have we have a county conservationist, county extension, uh, Brenda and Chip from DNR all on here tonight. And so a lot of resources uh, here in front of you tonight uh, tell you what we know about the lake 
and um, and help guide you through this process of creating a lake management plan. So a lot of information, you've received a lot of information already. I'm not going to let up on that pace at all. Uh, so I just want to I just want to reiterate that the county website, um, everything that we talk about tonight will be on that website, whether it be um, the the results of our study on your lake or the online survey that we encourage you to take or um, or a, a draft copy of your management plan, which I'll talk about later. Um, so uh, I encourage you to visit that, uh, gain oriented there, visit that stuff at your leisure. And um, and so this is just kind of just to get, get you going here. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm going to um, just kind of go over a couple of things here. Um, Again, uh, we may have we may have visited some of you a couple of years ago uh, when we started a study on Star Lake at the Meet Your Scientist event. Some of you may have been there, some of you may have not. Um, but uh, the, the first part of this process was to create, uh, to study your lake for two years and get a baseline of information. Uh, we're doing over 60 lakes across the county in this process. Uh, some of those lakes uh, have had studies and a lot of data collected on them in the past. Some have had very little to none collected. So uh, the first step was to, to get a baseline of information about your lake, um, find out where it's at, um, hopefully start trying to figure out where which way it might be headed. Um, and, um, and and, and, and then create a lake management plan. And so why a lake management plan? Why are we even doing this? Um, a lake management plan is, is as I describe it, is a, is a, it's a clearinghouse document of all the information about your lake. So there's a lot of different people that may be involved with your lake at any given point. Obviously the, the DNR is, is, is doing what they do there, whether it be surveys or stocking or things like that. You may have local sportsmen's clubs um, doing things uh local associations and then of course you have your individual landowners doing what they do on their property and, and, and on the lake and so um uh, and then it even extends out to things like the highway department or things or uh, parks department u.s forest service so there's a lot of people that that may be up to things that have a potential impact on your lake and so a lake management plane plan is really designed to be one a single document where everything we know about your lake is contained in, in one place um, and, and, and then coupled with that is your input. So the, the people that live on that lake, the people that see that lake every day, what are, what are they experiencing? What's their perspective? And what are their goals and objectives for the lake? Uh, so uh, whether that be something that needs to be changed, an issue that needs to be addressed, or whether it just means preserving something that you really value about that lake. And so uh, the, the lake management plan incorporates all that. Um, the lake management plan is also uh, increasingly required to receive assistance or attention to your lake. Um, so, you know, with over 15,000 lakes in the state and with the spread of invasive species and more and more people building houses on lakes, there's an increasing level of competition uh, for resources, um, for attention from various agencies um, to your lake. And having a, a, a lake management plan on file with the DNR, with the county, with your local municipality, um, uh, gives a voice to your lake. And so it, uh, it makes you more competitive for grants. Um, and it is a place for different agencies and different entities to see what's going on in your lake and where do you guys, where would you guys like to see it go? Um, doing this in advance, a lot of times lake management plans aren't created until you're dealing with a crisis. So historically, people come up with a lake management plan once they've discovered they have Eurasian water milfoil or something like that. Um, being able to create a plan in advance of that before there's a lot of stress um, is, is a good place to be. And, um, and so, and again, it, 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 it gives input from you, the people that live on the lake, um, coupled with what we know about the lake. 
So um, again, just to orient you, uh, there was a two-year study that began on Star Lake uh, uh, two years ago um, when we met with some of you. And that uh, two-year study was to collect some baseline information on your lake. And, it, and um, that information has been summarized into a report that's available on the county website. And we're also going to present to you tonight what we know about your lake. Um, and so we're now in, in phase two here of this process where we're going to develop a management plan. So we're going to take the science that we know about the lake and your input and, and create a direction for the management of this lake. Uh, once we have a management plan that we're satisfied with, and I'll talk about that later, um, that management plan will go on file with the DNR, the county, with your local municipality. Um, it'll be a point of reference for all those different uh, entities to refer to, uh, to know the latest about your lake and, and what you guys, um, uh, where you guys see the lake going. Um, and all those entities are, are aware of this, of this plan. So uh, comprehensive lake management plans are, are governed under uh, chapter NR 193 in the Wisconsin code. And uh, it requires all these different elements in there. So um, some baseline water quality data, uh, data on the aquatic plants in your lake, what the shoreland uh, property ownership is, what the land use in your watershed is, uh, what's going on with the fisheries in your lake, um, who, owns the, who owns the boat launch, um, and some modeling that I'll get into here in a little bit. So there's a bunch of really technical things that go in that are required to have a comprehensive management plan. And again, the, when it comes to competing for resources, whether it just be, whether it be a grant or competing for the attention of your fish biologist or somebody like that, um, having a comprehensive management plan in place um, is an indication that they're gonna get more bang for their buck on your lake. That, that the people that live on that lake have a holistic view of their lake. They understand what how their lake works at. They're not operating under tunnel vision of some specific issue and, and that there, there's gonna be a lot more bang for their buck for those resources. And so you can see this, it can be very technical. There's, there's, there's many pages involved in, in creating a, a lake management plan and guiding that process. Um, so what we propose and, and, and how, this, how we've been running this project um, uh, here, this countywide project is um, my, my staff at UW-Stevens Point will, will take the information we know, take the information that's shared tonight, as well as your comments, your, your, your survey responses, um, any issues you have, and we will draft a lake management plan um, and that meets all those specifications of NR193. And you can see here, there's a few pages from the plan that I've already started for you. And, um, and it, it'll be it comprised of chapters that cover each of those subjects, whether it be aquatic plants or invasive species or boating or what have you. Um, it just summarizes what we know about those issues. And then on the bottom right there, you can see each chapter will end with goals, objectives, and actions. And so that's really the meat of the plan. Um, and that, that is really where you guys come into play, what, what you're willing to do, where you would like to see this uh, management of this lake go in a certain direction and what you would like to see done, whether that means it's something you do or something that you would like to see the state do, what have you. And so uh, again, I'll talk about this at the end, but what I'll do is I'll draft an initial version of that plan and I'll probably start to insert some goals and actions and objectives in there to get you started uh, based on our discussion tonight. And then we'll email that out to everybody. We have your email addresses. Um, again, just like just like the survey or anything else, we encourage you to forward that email on to anyone else that might be interested. Um, and then we ask you to comment on that draft. Uh, anything you like, anything you don't like, some things you'd like to see changed, changed uh, suggestions, what have you. And periodically, we'll put out, I'll put out an updated draft and we'll send that out. And so we'll just kind of go through that iterative process until we have a general consensus uh, with everybody involved that they like what they see. Once we have a plan that we like, then that will go on file with the DNR, uh, with, with the county, uh, what have you. Um, just a reminder that, that this is based on current information and based on what you, what you guys would like to see for the lake, and that may evolve over time. So this is really designed to be a living document. 
Um, and so it's based on what we currently know and what we would currently like to do. As we go into the future, this document will, will, will be updated with what we learn and results of what things we may have tried. So uh, nothing that goes into this plan is really written in stone for, for good. It's, it's, it's designed to evolve over time. Um, so with that, we'll kick off. Uh, what do we know about this lake? And um, we'll start with everyone's favorite fisheries. And uh, we have Chip Long, a fisheries biologist in your area here tonight, and he's going to uh, tell you what he knows about Star Lake. Well, thanks, Ryan. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. All right. Sorry about the interruption there in the previous meeting. I thought I was muted. No problem. We got you muted. <laughs> yeah, I, quickly, I noticed. <laughs> and just for the audience tonight, uh, I'll quick introduction. My name's Chip. I'm a fish biologist here. Uh, my office is over in Peshtigo. Um, talk a little bit about my management area. It's kind of a unique place to work um, in that uh, we have waters of Green Bay. I work in Marinette County. We have boundary waters. Part of my management area is in the ceded territory, but O'Connell County, I split with my counterpart, Tammy Paoli. She works the southern part of O'Connell County and West Shore tributaries, and she does a lot of work on Green Bay proper. But 6432 is our, is our boundary for, for management of, of lakes and, and streams in O'Connell County. So I get the good part of the county, I tell her. Um, but just to give you an idea, there's probably about 40 fish biologists across the state. That doesn't include supervisors and, and district staff, including we have habitat folks, and of course our propagation or hatchery staff as well. So I think as a division um, or a bureau, we're about 200, 210 employees. So, you know, I talk to a lot of lake groups and sportsmen's clubs, and I always put this slide up. Um, so I can put, you know, Star Lake in particular, um, in the context of all my management responsibilities as it comes to specifically survey work. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time to kind of lay the foundation for, for the survey results for your lake. But to give you an idea, our high profile lakes are lakes that are a thousand acres or, or more, and they're on a six year rotation. And we generally do a full comprehensive survey that entails spring netting, spring, summer, fall electrofishing. And sometimes if we've got other management issues, we might even do some summer fike netting. And, um, even, you know, some recruitment stuff with mini fike nets in, in the fall. And I'm going to explain what, you know, in a little more detail, what that sampling looks like. Our next category of, of lakes are public access fisheries that vary in size from 100 to 1,000 acres. And those lakes are generally on an eight-year rotation. Um, some of those lakes we will really, depending on what the fishery looks like, will depend on the type of work we do, um, whether it's spring netting or just electro fishing. But in total, we have about 820 lakes or 25,000 acres of just lake habitat between those two counties. And we also have trout streams. You know, Marinette County has more classified miles of trout stream than any county in the state. And then we throw O'Connell County on top of that. So we have over a thousand miles of classified trout streams that we manage as well. Um, typically that work runs, our sampling work runs from about July 1st up through mid-September. Mid so we, we do anywhere from 35 to 50 individual stream sampling sites in a given season. So that's just our field work, not including some of the administrative things that we do. So when people ask, hey, why haven't you been to this lake? Um, Sometimes this is why. This is just the way we're kind of set up. Um, again, our surveys are designed to collect a representative sample or a snapshot of the fishery. Obviously, it's not practical or possible for us to go out and collect every single fish in a lake. So, you know, through years of, of experience, we've come up with, you know, a, a, a very good sampling design, again, to just capture that snapshot of the fishery. And one of the ways we do that is depending on the type of fish we want to collect will depend on the type of gear we use and when we use it. And a good example of that might be with walleye. If I want to look at the adult population, I'm going to set fike nets in the spring when they're spawning. But if I'm more interested in reproduction or recruitment, I'd do electrofishing in the fall after those hatched fish have had time to grow. So it just gives you an idea. Same species of fish, but different gear at a different time. Um, but one of the most important things that we try and do is to maintain comparability between our surveys. So standardizing, you know, locations of, of our gear, whether it be specifically nets or our electrofishing station. We'll take our shorelines, we break them down into 
two mile segments. Some of our lakes have, you know, 30 miles of shoreline. A lot of our smaller lakes might only be less than a mile or, you know, two to four miles. So where we would just collect all fish that we come in contact with. So that's kind of the way our, our survey designs are set up. So we talk, well, let me get back. It's not just me sitting at my desk saying, oh, well, we're going to sample this lake and we'll do it then. We have a nice handbook, or I call it my cookbook, that tells me what I'm going to do, the metrics, the data I'm going to collect, and the things I'm really evaluating through that survey. So it's very standardized, not just on a local level, but also on a statewide level, which again, increases the, the, uh, the value or the strength of our comparisons. So again, it's all laid out for us. When we talk about electrofishing, we play with electrofishing or with electricity and water. We're not the sharpest knives in the drawer, but we can do this safely. <laughs> so this is just a, this is like the driver of an electrofishing boat looking at the front. Um, there's a generator in it, and it's hardwired down through these booms here, these rings, and there's droppers that go in the water. That's where the electricity goes. So those would that kind of be the positive. The boat would be negative, and it creates a field. It's good and are effective in water to, you know, four to five to six feet deep, depending on the conductivity. Um, if you fell off the boat, it would not only hurt, it could result in fatality. So these pads that these guys are stepping on are actually like a safety switch. Um, if they step off the switch, it just, it kills the current. And so we have to, to reset all of our equipment and start again. But that's the way that's designed. The other thing we use is fike nets. So fike nets are a passive gear. The way this is designed, it's actually staked off the shore. And you see these floats here come out to this net. Well, there's actually a net that goes all the way to the bottom. And then there's a series of hoops and traps back through here. And if you were underwater, this is what it would kind of look like. So let me go back just a second. So as fish are swimming along the shore, they can't go that way. So as they try and go around the net, that's how they get trapped. And this is what it would look like underwater. So the shore would be back to your left here. And once they get back in there, they, they just can't find their way out. These are the types of things we try to avoid. This lead line is actually just a rope with lead in it. it. keeps the net down on the bottom. So fish, again, can't do like these guys are doing and go underneath it. So our survey results, a lot of times we don't, on these smaller lakes, and I know your lake's not that small. It's a little over 60 acres. Um, we don't have a lot of data. I was lucky enough with this to have some data. So we did a survey out there, an electrofishing one night survey in June of 2016. Um, the next most recent survey was 22 years previous. Um, you'll see one was done in June and one was done in August. And I'll touch on that as we go. But you can see relative abundance here. Largemouth bass was the most abundant predator in both years. And bluegill wasn't the most abundant panfish in 1994, but it was in, in 2016. And I think that had more to do with the timing. Um, and we're talking about a, a pretty noticeable decline in the number of rock bass collected. Um, but here you can see we collected 136 fish in our circuit around the lake that night. And here's the various sizes. And I'll talk about the, the two most dominant bass and bluegill here. Um, and what I did, because I had comparable data, I, I put them both on the same slide. Um, so here is your bluegill. Only six of the fish that we collected were over six inches, and that's generally what we consider to be a harvestable size. Average was about 5.1 inches. Again, very similar to what we saw in 2016 um, in terms of number. Look at largemouth bass, collected a handful more, about 10%, 15% more, um, 102 fish in our last survey. Size structure wasn't bad. Um, a few legal fish, a lot of smaller fish, um and the intermediate sub-adult i would call um where again being this was done so late in the year wasn't surprised to see these are probably age one fish um age two maybe three and a little bit older probably four or five years old but we do actually age fish and we spend a considerable amount of time doing that and how we do it is we either take scales or actually we'll take these hard dorsal spines. We just cut and remove one, the webbing grows back, the spine won't, and we section it off. But scales in particular, what we do is we put them on like a plastic microscope slide and we run them through a press just like this. And what it does is it creates an impression on that slide. And so we can actually count the rings, not necessarily count the rings. Every year it'll lay down a hard annulus. 
Um, and that's how we age those fish. And the we reason we do this is so between surveys is something going on in this particular lake that would change the growth uh, of the fish and how are fish in your lake growing comparative, comparatively to, to other lakes in, in the local area or even on a statewide scale. So bluegill in particular, they didn't age any fish from the 1994 survey. I don't know why uh, the data wasn't in the database and it wasn't in the files. So they just didn't age fish and, and age and growth, depending on the objectives of your survey can be optional. I generally will do at least the dominant game fish and the dominant pan fish again, just to have an idea of how that looks on a more regional scale. But you can see here, bluegill growth was average. Um, they had 15 of the fish were, were age three. And to give you an idea, when we get a sample of fish, we collect five structures per half inch group. So from three to three and a half inches, we would take five samples from five individual fish. Um, from three and a half to four inches, we would take five. So we do get a pretty good sample, um, but you can see our age three fish ranged in length from 3.9 to six inches. And, and we only had two year classes represented there and we aged 20 of those. For largemouth bass, again, we had fish ranging in age from one to 11. Um, most of our lakes in Northern O'Connell County, we're looking at that about, around, about seven to get to 14 inches here. It's eight, not a big deal, but you can see once they get a little older, growth has a tendency to slow down. And that's pretty typical in most of our fish populations because once fish become sexually mature, they put more energy into reproduction than they do growth. So they grow really fast when they're young and when they're teenagers, but once they get to adults, they don't necessarily grow longer. They get a little fatter, kind of like what's happening to me, although I'm not a teenager or even a young adult anymore. But that's just kind of just a typical what we see. And again, when we get to these lower ages, you can see our sample size, sample size starts to decline. We didn't see a lot of bigger fish, so we didn't age a lot of bigger fish. So whether this is really representative of what's going on, I'd say we're pretty good through, you know, age six but once we get a little bit older we just didn't have as many fish to age but below average at those older ages uh, i think being that it's a, a seepage lake it's it would be very comparable to some of our other local lakes and you know I, i'm just putting the lake map map up when we do this survey again we're just going along the shoreline and some lakes that we we manage have you know a pretty extensive littoral zone and, and and Ryan will describe this in more detail, but um, you know we're making one pass with the boat, which is you know six or eight feet wide. So we're sampling a you know a ten or twelve foot area um, in a path around the lake. So a lot of times there's habitat away from the shore where fish could be, you know. And we do this at night. You know, fish are inherently wary of predators. Um, so when it gets dark, a lot of these fish come in shallow to feed. So that's why we we do it at night. And, and again, this littoral zone or this near shore area is going to be the most critical habitat specifically for aquatic, you know, life in, in any lake. You know, up to 90% of all aquatic organisms spend a significant part of their life or some portion of their life in this zone. And fish in particular will spend more time, 700% more along the undeveloped shoreline than a developed shoreline. So when we talk about, you know, enhancing the littoral zone and fish habitat, this is the probably the most critical, is the most critical habitat in the lake. So some of the things that we can do to mitigate habitat loss are what we call fish sticks, which essentially is just a, a fancy, I don't even want to call it fancy term, but really what we're doing is, is enhancing this coarse woody debris in these near shore areas in that littoral zone. And essentially we do this by taking full size trees during the winter, place them on the ice and we anchor them. So this is like a cross section. We want deeper water. We don't want to put a full size tree in a foot of water and muck because most of it wouldn't be in the water, which is where we're trying to actually, you know, create a, create new or, or enhanced habitat. So this is just a top down view of what it might look like. And here's a picture of one, uh, a project we did over on Pile Lake in 2018. We put about 70 trees at 17 or 18 locations, partnered with the county and the Lake Association to complete this project. Um, and here's the, the trees are cut. So they're just taking them and moving them in place. And this is what they look like. Then what we do is we come through and we actually drill holes in these trees and attach a cable and an anchor. We just crimp this over that, uh, over the cable there. So it won't come off. And then this is what we call a duckbill anchor. This end is actually hollow. We take a long steel rod and drive it down into the ground. And then if 
there's any tension on this cable, what happens is this, this anchor turns sideways and it won't pull out of the ground. We don't want these things to drift away, you know, become a navigation or a safety hazard or just wind up where we don't want them to be. We do have some stipulations on the type and size of material that we use for these projects. We typically like to stay with hardwoods, minimum diameter of, of 18 inches. But the benefic benefit of these fish sticks projects are that you can put a lot of material on a limited shoreline where previously we weren't able to do that. Um, we were limited through administrative code, but we've since uh, made some modifications to, to allow for this technique on our inland lakes. Uh, one, of, one of the other things that, that I've worked on quite a bit uh, in the last decade or so, I've probably done about six or eight of these walleye spawning reefs. Um, this is actually a picture from Archibald Lake. This was an extension of a reef that we built in 2008. We added about another 650 feet to it. To give you an idea, it was about 330 tons of rocks. So probably about, oh, I want to say 12, 13 dump trucks full of, of stone that we spread on the ice to create walleye spawning habitat. Um, and fish cribs. Fish cribs are another thing. While they're not the best habitat technique, because again, they're not in the littoral zone, they're out in deeper water. Um, it's something that's relatively inexpensive, but it's more of a quantity versus a quality technique. So here's just some, some of the materials before the project. What we generally do is we come out and we, we drill these logs, just like we drilled those fish sticks. Um, doesn't really matter where the holes are, as long as they're all the same distance apart on each tree. So the cribs will go together a lot better. This is kind of what they'll look like. And we actually build these up in four to five feet of water. And we come out in the spring after the ice goes out and we move them to where we want them by boat. There are some stipulations in terms of bottom type and slope. Um, additionally, when the ice melts, it doesn't always melt uniformly. Sometimes these things will get carried away or if there's not enough weight in them, you know, we've got to find them. So by doing it this way, we, we've had less of those, those incidences. So that's just a few habitat techniques that we've, we've uh, done. And of course, we do a lot of trout stream habitat too that I didn't include in tonight's presentation, but um, we do a lot of uh, trout habitat work as well. Some of the other things that I work on, we're just currently we're in a, you know, a work planning cycle where we're planning all of our work for the next two years. Of course, you know, we go out and we collect all of this fish data. So, you know, we, we enter it, we analyze it, we age these fish and we do prepare management reports and, and the survey report for Star Lake is available online. Um, I work just completed a, a land acquisition on a fishery area. We bought some property. We're always reviewing permits as Ryan found out during our last meeting. I was taking advantage of being in the office tonight. Um, property management, I manage a couple properties. So all the things that go on with, you know, being a good neighbor um, and sometimes just picking up trash. Um, we have to deal with those things. A lot of youth outreach. We work with the county has a camp and, and various school districts take advantage of, of, of camp, that camp. So we, we participate there. State county fairs do a lot of classroom, job shadow, you name it. Um, I sit on several department teams. And there's species teams or specific stat task groups. You know, we develop regulation proposals for the spring hearings. You know, always working with external partners, you know, various lake associations, sportsmen's clubs, counties, state, federal, you name it. And part of that process is also, you know, the defining factor sometimes for some of these projects can be money. So, you know, securing external funding in the form of grants to complete projects, whether it's on road stream crossings, you know, uh, boating facilities and whatnot. So. I know that's a lot of information, like Ryan said, in a very short amount of time. But if you have questions now, that's great. Um, if you don't and you think of something, I'll be here throughout the meeting. You can type it in the chat. I can respond to you privately. Um, or I can entertain any questions you have now. Any questions for Chip? Of course, you can you can contact him at any time. Uh, he's a nice guy; I can attest to. So, we'll get your question. <laughs> yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Chip? I can. This is Tom Morgan. I, uh, my wife and I, did a lot of the survey stuff for the lake, uh, helping out the DNR. And I know you got a huge job because you cover a, an awesome area. But like you said before, we're more worried about fisheries and stuff. And I know a lot of the fish in Star Lake tend to be very, very small. Uh, just something, I mean, the bass years ago, I've been on this lake since 1958. They used to be a little bit bigger, not that I'm a bass fisherman. We actually did have some walleye in here at one time, 
uh, but there's no place for them to spawn, obviously. Would the DNR ever consider something like that? I know we're considered a minor fishery because we're under 100 acres. So uh, I don't know that you'd ever consider that. It'd probably put way too much pressure on this lake because it's a small lake. But I'm just curious to know whether you've ever thought of that. Uh, we've seen your shocking boats on the lake. Uh, I even saw them back in the 60s uh, when they used to do the, the right. survey. Well, specifically in developing a walleye fishery, you're right. There's probably not adequate habitat for them to spawn. However, that doesn't mean you can't create a walleye fishing opportunity in this particular lake. I can tell you with, with a pretty good amount of confidence, there are a lot of walleye fisheries in your area. So to establish another one probably wouldn't happen. One, again, it is probably, most of it would be due to the size of your lake. Two, we're already pretty much at capacity as it ter in terms of production. You know, statewide, we're stocking about 800,000 large fingerling walleyes and all of our lakes are on an alternate year stocking rotation because we can't stock every lake every year so all of our lakes are on alternate year rotation so that way you know we can spread more fish around but that's not to say that you as a group if you guys as a as a, as a lake group or an association decide hey we would really like to establish a walleye fishing opportunity on your lake you can apply for a stocking permit it's free I'd be the one evaluating it, but it's one of those opportunities. Once you create it, you know, there's going to be the expectation that you're going to maintain it. So, you know, your lake at, and I'm just going to give you an idea of what it would cost you. Um, on average, these fish are about $2, $2.50 a piece. It'd be about eight inches long. Um, I would recommend a stocking rate of probably five per acre. So you'd be talking about 300 fish a year. So the price tag of, you know, 600 to uh, seven hundred dollars maybe 750 um on an annual basis and you know only about probably 20 to 30 percent of those are actually going to survive to be 15 inches so you can start doing the math to see how expensive those fish are going to be by the time they get there to, you know to 15 inches um and there's a lot of groups even in Ocano county who do maintain a walleye fishery through stocking without help from the state so it is possible now back to your original question or observation about your fish being kind of small and, and, and your growth is slower than it would be in Northern Wisconsin, but that's because you're a seepage lake. You know, a lot of people equate these nice, clear, beautiful water. We have some beautiful lakes in O'Connell County, but that clear water doesn't transcend into what fish production, you know? So when you have really clear water, there's not a lot of algae blooms there isn't a lot of zooplankton and so essentially what i'm describing there's nothing driving that food chain and as a result these seepage lakes don't hold the biomass or the pounds of fish per acre let's say like a lake down in the valley where agricultural runoff is really you know there's a lot of adverse ad impacts to water quality when you're in a highly agricultural watershed we don't have that problem but as a result, we don't have the standing crop or biomass of fish in these seepage lakes. That's why they are clean, clear, and pretty. Um, you do have weed growth, I'm sure. Um, and some of those things can, can lead to some of the observations we see in whether it be abundance or size structure or growth. But I think the general trend in Northern O'Connell County is in these seepage lakes. We just don't see the biomass. So that would lead me to my next you know, question is, you know, would your lake be better suited for maybe a reduced bag limit um are you not top do you not have enough predators to reduce competition amongst bluegills to allow growth to improve so i think there's some questions we could answer but then we have to put it in the grander scheme of everything that we have to do in terms of management not that it's not possible and ryan will touch on this later developing a plan like this with these sorts of objectives carries some weight especially when it comes time to pick and choose you know when we have an active group on a lake that that's involved and, and wants to, to move forward and, and make those improvements, it, it makes it, you know, when you have to make choices, it's a little easier to make a choice um, when you're going to be working with a group versus a lake that doesn't necessarily have a group. You know, and there are a lot of lakes that we, that we work on that don't necessarily have organized associations, but I don't want to get too far off. Ryan's still got a lot to go through. Those are good questions. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to discuss that, uh, in greater detail well well i suspect you're right because when we did the uh, seeky disc and you know the water samples and stuff over the last couple of years our lake is fairly clear mm -hmm. i mean for the most part there wasn't much 
on the phosphate exams and stuff. There just wasn't a whole lot of algae in there. And and that's where when we when we get into things like enhancing habitat, see that's that's where you start to have those improve. You make those improvements to to the fish populations as well. You know. Okay. Well, thank you. No problem. Thanks, Chip. Um, can I ask? Do you guys uh, do you guys have a, a, any sort of organization, an association, or a friends group, or anything on Star Lake? No, we do not. Okay. All right. Anything else for Chip before we move on? And I think Chip will stick around for a while, so we can certainly. Uh, revisit that stuff. And some of the things I'm going to talk about will um, all relate to that. It's it's all part of the web and it all connects here. Um, so beyond the fishery, I'm, I just want to present some of the, the, the other information we gathered from this, this uh, two year uh, study. And, um, and, and, and just to put, give you start, start broad and, and move in more specific, um, just to understand how lakes work in general. Um, lakes go through a natural aging process. And so uh, as low spots on the landscape, uh, they, they accumulate things, uh, whether it be sediment or, or muck, uh, fish and plants die off and, and a bit, over time lakes fill up. Um, and given enough time, a lake will fill up completely and become a, a marsh or a wetland. Um, and uh, a lot of these lakes in this area are about 10,000 years old. They were created during the last ice age. And they've been going through this aging process for thousands of years uh, before we got here. Um, and uh, most lakes start off with relatively sandy, rocky, hard bottom. And then as they accumulate um, sediments and, and decaying material, they go through this aging process until they eventually become some sort of marsh or something. And this is kind of what, what Chip was talking about. Uh, Star Lake has, has remained a relatively young lake, if you will, um, throughout this process. And so there's, there, it has very clear water, and there's just not as much uh, driving the food chain there as as the, as the lake ages through the through these other uh, phases here, as you see on this this diagram. Um, typically, that wildlife, that that food chain, it tends to accelerate, um, and but with that acceleration comes comes muck and aquatic plants and, and algae and things like that. And so, um, so there, there are advantages to that, that aging process and, and there are disadvantages. Um, typically our, our activities on the landscape accelerate this process. Uh, but again, after these lakes have been around for thousands of years, uh, we only have so much we can do when it comes to management. We can kind of nudge these lakes in one direction or another. So it's important to have uh, to to recognize where your lake is at in a, in a bigger picture and 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 have realistic expectations for your lake. Um, also important to have basic understanding of the water cycle. So where's your water coming from and where's it going? Um, in, in the most basic sense, uh, we have precipitation falling from rainstorms. And when that water hits the ground, uh, uh, some of it will move across the surface of the land as, as runoff, as surface runoff. And some of it will get a chance to infiltrate into the ground and become groundwater. Either way, the, the idea of, that, of a particular drop of water is to make its way back to the ocean. Ocean. And so it's looking for the path of least resistance to get to the closest water body and from there move to the closest river and from there move to the closest ocean. And, and that's what water is trying to do. Um, surface runoff has a lot more energy to it. So water running across the surface of the land carries uh, contaminants with it. It carries sediment. It carries these things with it. When water gets a chance to infiltrate, um, it, it moves much slower to that water body. It, it feeds that water body over time and also gets a chance to uh, filter itself uh, through those soils in that, wa in that water and, and, and accumulate minerals and things like that. So there, there's a general theme when it comes to lake management to reducing surface water runoff and increase, increasing the, the chance for that water to infiltrate into the groundwater. So what shapes 
what shapes a lake's character? Again, why is your lake different from a lake a mile down the road, uh, which is different from the lake next to it? Um, there's a lot of different things. Uh, in, in a bigger picture, we have different types, types of lakes. So Star Lake being a seepage lake, it gets most of uh, its water from groundwater, and most of the lake, most of the water is moving out of that lake via groundwater as well, uh, as opposed to a lake that might have a, a, an outlet creek or, or, or river um, to it. As I said, a lot of lakes in the area are about 10,000 years old following the last glaciation. So uh, the age of, of a lake and how much time it's had to age uh, will also shape its character. The geology, the soil types, the topography surrounding the lake, um, uh, the lake will respond to that and that will have different impacts. Uh, seasonal environmental changes. Lakes here in Wisconsin, they, they freeze over several months of the year. Uh, lakes in the southern part of the country don't necessarily freeze over. Um, and so that's a dynamic that, that comes into play with our lakes here in Wisconsin and, and, and is part of the, the system at work here. Um, obviously, uh, land use around the lake, uh, in the watershed, near the shore, um, these, are all, these are all things that have an effect on, on how the lake responds. And generally, the closer you move to a lake, the greater your potential impact to that lake is. So here's a bathymetric map, as we call these. Uh, this is a, a new one developed by the DNR during this last study. Um, uh, used to, uh, these, these contour maps were, were created. They'd go out on the ice and drill a bunch of holes through the ice and lower a weight down and see how deep it was at that point and then connect the dots. And that's how they drew those maps uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, now, of course, we have sonar, so we can continuously scan the bottom. So we have an updated uh, depth map here of um, Star Lake um, that's available electronically. Um, this being a seepage lake, uh, it, you know, it hasn't, it has, probably hasn't changed a whole lot from those initial surveys, but we found a maximum depth of about, uh, it says 21 feet reported on the website, but I can see here in our, uh, in our sonar scan, we found a couple of holes as deep as 24 feet. Um, so again, I, I, I hark back to the uh, online survey, um, just a couple of places where that comes into, into play. Uh, if you haven't taken the survey, I encourage you to do it. If you know a neighbor or family member that hasn't done it, uh, send them the link. Uh, we definitely incorporate those responses into our thinking and our planning about this lake. Uh, this is one of the questions from those surveys and just a couple of responses I got. Uh, what do you think are the biggest impacts to Star Lake? Um, water quality degradation and excessive, excessive plant growth, algae blooms were the, were the two biggest concerns that were commented on. So we'll take a look at some of that. Um, each time we go out and take a, take a water sample uh, in various times of the year, uh, one of the things we do is we measure temperature with depth. And, uh, um, and so uh, this, is, this is a graph of some of those results. Each, each colored line is a different sampling event. And um, we, we start by taking the, the temperature near the surface, and then we, we take the temperature every few feet as it, with, with depth here. And so on this graph, the, the surface of the lake runs along the top and then gets, gets deeper as you go down. And you can see temperature across the top there. So in general, the, the water near the surface, as you would expect, is, is similar to the ambient air temperature at the time. Um, and so during the summer, you know that those surface temperatures is 78 to 80 degrees typically. And, um, and then in, in, in winter, fall, spring, those temperatures are closer to the 40s. Um, and then in this lake, this is, this is a relatively shallow, shallow lake uh, most, most of the time, as this would show, is that in that our temperatures uh, stay similar. Uh, it's a similar temperature is maintained with depth. And so, um, you know, whether you look on the left there with those green and blue lines or, or the yellow and gray lines moving further to the right, our temperature doesn't change a whole lot with depth. And, and that, that basically indicates a lake that stays well mixed um, from surface to the bottom. And um, that, that is considered a, a shallower lake. Now, sometimes we get that blue and orange line on the far right. So in, in, in July, um, we, we start to develop a little bit of stratification in the lake. And, and what happens there when the lake stratifies is that we have 
warmer water uh, near the surface uh, becomes separated from colder water being fed by uh, the, the water depth being fed by groundwater, which is a, a cool, cooler temperature at the bottom. So um, if you look at those two far right ones in, 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 in July of 2018, uh, we get uh, temperatures that, that remain pretty similar down to about 10 or 15 feet. And then suddenly the temperatures drop off um, until you get to about 20 feet where they start to stabilize again. And that's a little bit of stratification uh, developing. And that prevents surface water, water at the surface from mixing with water at depth. And so your lake is, is right on the cusp of something that would be considered a shallow lake or a deep lake. It tends to stratify at times. Um, and that, I'll show you where that comes into play here in a little bit. Water clarity is another thing that we measure. Um, this is a very simple measurement with a, with a Secchi disc. Um, basically, we just lower this standardized disc, as you see there, down into the water and see how deep it goes until it disappears. And what that measures is how far light is penetrating into the water. Um, so that, that's affected by things like color. So uh, maybe tannins or staining from, from, from wetlands. Um, certainly sediment um, being churned up from the bottom can affect water clarity. And then of course, algae blooms going on that can also affect water clarity. So uh, you can see there, as you can imagine, water clarity can definitely vary over time. It can be different from one day to the next. Um, but when you get a, a good um, long-term data set of water clarity measurements, uh, you can start to see patterns and you can start to determine trends. And so water clarity is a very inexpensive and simple way to uh, keep an eye on your lake. And again, once you have a long-term data set, you can start to monitor uh, whether there are significant changes occurring in your lake simply by measuring water clarity. Uh, so when we look at our, our water clarity data over time, uh, we've got a handful of, of water clarity samples. If you look on the bottom there from uh, 2008 or so, um, and I'm not sure what was going on, some sort of study in the area at that time. And then on the right side of the graph there, our, our study period here, 2018, 2019. And so those are the water clarity measurements we have um, for Star Lake. And you can see the variability in those different measurements each time we went out. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you plot a trend on the average between those, those two time periods, um, it would suggest that our water clarity hasn't changed much over the past 10 years or so. Um, this, again, this is pretty relatively limited data. So uh, ongoing measurements uh, through time will, will, will hopefully um, be able to indicate uh, whether there's a trend in one direction or another, or if nothing else, be able to suggest uh, if you do start to see a change that something is occurring in your lake. Uh, the graph at the top there uh, shows uh, the blue squares are the historical average by month of water clarity, and the red dots are the averages by month uh, over the two-year study of more recent data. And you can see those values are relative, are, they're, they're pretty similar, um, sometimes almost exactly the same in, in, in April, for example. Um, but that, that, just, that just shows that um, it's a pretty, pretty stable um, in terms of water clarity, that it's not changing significantly. And usually stable is a good thing. Um, dissolved oxygen is another thing we measure. So uh, oxygen in the water is important, obviously. Our, our fish need it to breathe. Uh, our sources of oxygen are primarily are um, at the surface, uh, exchange uh, with the atmosphere, um, getting fresh oxygen into the water, and then also photosynthesis from our aquatic plants and algae um, also put oxygen into the system. And so each time we go out, we also measure uh, dissolved oxygen with depth, uh, similar to how we did temperature. So we, we, we lower our meter in and we take a reading every few feet with depth. Um, and so you can see here, we have a, a handful of measurements uh, from different times of the year. Uh, typically 10 to 12 uh, uh, parts per million oxygen, as you can see across the top there, is considered saturated, as you would expect uh, water near the surface to be relatively saturated with oxygen um, as it's being mixed by wave action and activity. And then we can see how our oxygen concentrations change with depth. And again, as you would expect for a shallow lake, which this lake behaves as most of the time, um, and that is that it 
the water stays relatively well mixed, our oxygen concentrations don't change significantly with depth. They're, they're, they're pretty continuous. Um, other than that gray line, and that's, that's, that was in February of 2019, and so that's late winter essentially. So at that point, our lake has been um, uh, frozen um, for, for a couple of months. Um, so we don't have access to that uh, exchange of oxygen with the atmosphere. We're cut off from that. Likewise, in the wintertime, most of our plants have died off and our algae has died off. So we don't have a source of oxygen uh, in, in the water either. And as a result, our oxygen concentrations as we go deeper um, are dropping off significantly. The pink portion of this graph is is um, five parts per million of oxygen and less. And that's a general, as a general rule of thumb, that's about, about five parts is when uh, most uh, fish species start to become stressed. Um, and, and at some point they can't survive in uh, oxygen concentrations that low. And so you can see uh, late, late winter in, in, in February when we haven't had any new inputs of oxygen, um, by the time we get down to about 12 feet, we're less than five parts of oxygen there. And so at that point, the fish need to come up to shallower water to, to, to have sufficient oxygen. Um, but that also shows that, that, you know, winter kills are probably not a, a big threat in this lake, um, that even in, even in late winter, we've got at least 10, 12 feet of, of water that, that's well oxygenated. Ryan? Yes, sir. I'm going to interrupt you quick and a question. Hey. Um, is there a thermocline in July? I get that um, in before you went too far. Yes. Well, according to this, and again, this is this is relatively limited data, so we've only got. Um, uh, and 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 I know I know um, I know Tom Tom and Linda have probably collected more data since that's not shown in this graph, but. It, it shows that in mid to late July, we do start to develop a thermocline, but this lake is really on the edge of that. So uh, most of the year, it doesn't have a thermocline. It's not stratified and stays pretty well mixed. Uh, when it, during the hottest parts of the summer, um, it looks like it may start to develop some stratification. So it's, it's right there on the edge. Right, I got one more thing. It's Tom Morgan again. Yeah. You talked about the weeds. I can mm -hmm. recall that during the, like say I've been here since 58, in the 50s and 60s, we had a lot of what we called healthy weeds, pond mm -hmm. weed type growth. Uh, that disappeared for a number of years. It has started to come back now, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that gives you any information or not. Uh, you know, we, we seem to have some healthy weeds, but we also have some weeds now that I've never seen before. They're, they're not necessarily bad but they're sure. long stuff well that that's that's a good see i've got i've got some information on some more recent plant surveys here so that we will we'll take a look at that um we've got newer methods of of surveying and measuring those plants now so that we can more uh accurately compare um, and look at change over time. Um, you know, historically, we've just had to rely on people's memories like, well, there used to be more weeds and this and that, but um, I'll, I'll show you some survey data here um, that, that, that illustrates some of that. And so hopefully going forward, we'll, we'll be able to, to monitor that more accurately. I'm, I'm sorry, I just noticed that uh, Chip put in there about how water levels have changed. Uh, it's been phenomenal the last couple of years. Sure. Of course, sure. we've had a ton of moisture, but I know uh, it, it just, it's unreal how much water this lake has started to retain just in the last few years. That's one of the reasons I think all the trees blew over when the Direco or whatever you want to call it came through here in 2019 yeah. because the roots were just saturated sure. and they, the trees just tipped over. Well, Star Lake is suffering from that too. I have neighbors who, who've lost waterfront uh, or have gained waterfront. You could say it's closer to their house anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether that's just a phenomenon from recently or whether it's something that's going to continue, I don't know. We're hoping it doesn't continue, obviously. Sure. I mean, changes in water levels are definitely part of, uh, you know, a very natural cycle that lakes experience. Um, 
you know, again, the fact that these lakes are thousands of years old, um, even when we've been on these lakes a generation or two, um, that's really pretty recent in the lifetime of these lakes. And so they, they very naturally experience these, these fluctuations. And, um, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but that's, that's part of the importance of, of having, um, you know, uh, 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 development around the shoreline, you know, you, you, you built, you know, you may have been there 20 years, so you build a gazebo, and all of a sudden now that gazebo is underwater. Well, your 20 years is nothing compared to the life of that lake. And so it's a very natural and it's a very healthy thing for these, these, these lake levels to fluctuate. Um, it's just like the, the tide coming in out on an ocean, but on a much longer term scale. Um, and, and indeed, uh, water levels are up now. They're, they're up all across the state. Um, the biggest thing I used to work on uh, five, 10 years ago was everyone's lakes were disappearing down here in the central sands in central Wisconsin. And, um, and everyone was freaking out that their lakes were, were going dry. And, and of course, now everyone's just flooded. And, um, and that's, that's a big part of that is just our attention span and, and, and our, um, our time with these lakes compared to how old these lakes are and what their natural cycles, cycles are. Um, and then, of course, there's the idea of climate change. You know, climate change in, in this area um, predicts that we will get wetter um, with time, uh, that we will have uh, more and bigger precipitation events in this area. And so this may be the new normal, uh, and, and only time will tell. Ken, do they, uh, is, 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 or does anyone, know, is, is Star monitoring water levels there? Do they have a well or anything there? I, I don't know of any that, uh, okay. but I know that it is significantly gotten higher in my lifetime. Uh, like sure. I say, 58, it's, it's as high as I've ever seen Star Lake right now. Yeah, yeah. And and Ken Shop has has some uh, long term uh, water level water level monitoring going on in some of the lakes in the area, and I know there's even uh, some some uh, local roads that are oftentimes flooded. Um, again, down here in central Wisconsin as well. Um, and um, again, in, in in the in the large scale of of these systems, that's that's part of the that's part of the cycle. But also, it, it you know it remains to be seen. But this may be a a, a trend that we're seeing um, as as our climate changes as well. So, um, okay. So moving on, uh, nutrients. Another thing we measure: phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, of course, these are these are natural compounds in the environment. They're they're essential for life and and for growth. We're all composed of, of phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, with lakes, where we run into problems is when we get excessive amounts of nutrients in the water. Um, that's what grows our aquatic plants. It's what grows algae. Um, if that phosphorus is available, something's going to eat it. Um, whether it, so, it might be plants, it might be algae. Uh, so. I often tell people if, if you've got excessive plants, that may be an indication of, of high phosphorus levels, but um, you'd rather have the plants eat them than, than, than the algae because uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, issues associated with algae blooms. Um, sources of phosphorus, and, and phosphorus is the main one we look at, um, there are very, a lot of nat mostly natural sources of phosphorus. Uh, phosphorus tends to uh, bind to soil particles. Um, it's, it's uh, by itself, it's ionic and likes, likes to bind to soil particles. So a lot of, a lot of sources of phosphorus are, are soils and, and wetlands, things like that, that might be uh, inputs to our lake. Anytime you get erosion or runoff, that's usually bringing phosphorus with it. Um, as I said before, anytime plants or animals die and start to decay, they release phosphorus to the system. It's part of that muck um, in the bottom of the lake. Um, and, and as such, that, that muck contains a lot of phosphorus. Those fine sediments and stuff in the bottom of the lake are, are holding a lot of phosphorus in place. And so another source of phosphorus in our water is if uh, any of those sediments become resuspended, uh, whether it be by wave action or boating activity or raking the lake, uh, things like that, uh, this will, this will resuspend those sediments and make phosphorus available for, for algae and plant growth. Um, and then, and then, you know, man-made sources of phosphorus include uh, erosion, uh, storm runoff, 
uh, fertilizer, and then wastewater, which is primarily our septic systems, are, they're all contributing uh, nutrient into the system. And so if, if phosphorus and excessive plant growth or algae growth is an issue, um, of those sources, we only have control or the ability to change, um, uh, you know, certain sources. We're not going to, we're not going to change the, the plants and animals or the soils. Um, it's, it's only our inputs that we have any control over. So when we look at phosphorus data over time, again, you know, here, this is just a snapshot in time over this two-year study period um, where we had uh, phosphorus concentrations uh, anywhere from, you know, six, seven, up to 10. And those are all considered pretty low. That, that red line across the top for, for a shallow seepage lake, such as STAR, uh, 40, parts, 40 parts per billion of, of phosphorus is considered a threshold for a shallow seepage lake. And once you start getting phosphorus concentrations over that 40, um, then you really start to develop some adverse effects in the lake, uh, nuisance algae blooms, um, excessive plant growth, things like that. All these phosphorus levels uh, during this period were relatively low. But I, again, I would also just stress that this is, this is a, a, a very small data set. And so it'll be important over time to, to monitor those phosphorus concentrations. Uh, the, the yellow squares there are phosphorus, and if I, if I just plotted a simple trend line through that, it would, it would suggest that phosphorus concentrations were higher in 2019 than 2018. That's two years, so it remains to be seen where that's going to go. Um, with that, uh, we have chlorophyll, which are, the, which are the green dots, and chlorophyll is kind of an indirect measure of algae in the water. And, uh, and because our phosphorus concentrations were higher in 2019 than 2018, uh, we saw more algae in the water in 2019 than in 2018. Um, so so that, that is to be expected. Um, again, that two-year trend would be increasing. Um, but two years over 10,000, it's hard to say where this is going. So again, you just want to continue to, to monitor that over time to, to really tease out uh, if, if this is increasing, if it's decreasing, if it's stable, what, what have you. Brian, we, uh, it's Tom Morgan again. Yeah. We did do survey last year also in 2020. I sent the data down to, I think his name is Brian Zwicky down at Chano. Yep. I didn't have access to the internet or whatever. He may not have entered that yet, but that would give you three years worth of data. Instead yes, of two. and that that helps, and I can I can add that to that for the plan. I I'm looking at that now. I've got uh, two phosphorus concentrations for 2020, one in July and and one in September, and they were 13.6 and 14.2 uh, respectively. So again, that in, just in that in that state same zone that that we see on the on the on the previous two years of data. Uh, chlorophyll for those two dates was uh, less than two on both of those. So, um, you know, again, if you put that on this graph, that would um, definitely show that things are pretty stable over the three year period at least. Uh, pollutants is another thing we look at, things like potassium, chloride, sodium. Um, those are uh, in and of themselves at natural concentrations. Uh, none of those things are particularly detrimental to the lake. Uh, but at the same time, none of those things exist in the lake naturally. Uh, so we sample for those uh, as, as indicators or tracers, if you will, of, of contamination from various sources uh, like road salts or septic systems. All those concentrations were low. Um, and so it doesn't indicate significant uh, impacts from any of those sources at this time. Uh, important to understand your watershed. So, uh, you know, your watershed is the area of land draining to your lake. Uh, so as I said before, when you have a drop of water uh, fall from the sky, uh, it wants to make its way through the path of least resistance to, to the nearest water body. And so that area of land draining to that lake, whether it be from the surface or, or through groundwater, is your watershed. So if you, if you want to make adjustments to uh, land use that might be impacting your lake, it's important to know what area of land is, is draining to your lake. So when we delineate that as part of this study, uh, we have a 589 acre watershed to Star Lake. 
Um, and you can see the area of land there uh, based on topography and various things um, that drains to Star Lake. And so the pie chart at the bottom um, shows you the, the, the uh, relative amounts of land use in that watershed. So we've in, the, in that 589 acres, we've got about a third of it is in agriculture, uh, about a little over a third of it is in forest. Um, got 13% uh, wetlands and about 6% is considered uh, developed land, if, if you will. Uh, the, the, the blue lines across there are the groundwater contours. And so the black arrows show you uh, which way groundwater is moving in that area. And uh, it, it's a similar direction as our, our surface watershed, uh, water moving from the Northwest. Um, when we model this watershed, so we, we incorporate things like topography, soil types, climate, things like that, uh, we can, uh, the model tells us what, where are our sources of phosphorus coming from. So of that 33% of agriculture in our watershed, it's modeled that 80% of our phosphorus is coming from, from the, that ag land. Um, 10% of our phosphorus is coming from forest land. So you, any type of land use uh, exports phosphorus, it's part of the normal weathering um, that occurs. Uh, but when you wanna look at, at, at where your biggest sources of phosphorus are coming from, that, that pie chart on the right there would, would suggest that. And again, of course, uh, you know, the closer to the lake you go, um, the bigger the, the potential impact. Uh, so this brings us to habitat, uh, shoreland and near shore, and this heart, you know, this goes back to a big part of what Chip was talking about. In that, uh, as, again, as we move closer to the lake, we have a greater potential for impact, whether that be good or bad on our lake. And um, as shoreland property owners, you you have you're kind of the last line of defense for that for that 500 plus acres that's draining to your, your property. And so uh, shoreland, shoreland buffers are, are kind of a silt fence, if you will, um, along that protect that lake. And how, how you manage your property along the edge of the lake uh, has an effect on water quality as well as, as, as fish and wildlife. Um, and so you can just kind of see some contrasting um, um, management there in, in, the, in the top picture. In the bottom picture, I like to show those because those are a couple of examples of some shoreland restoration projects that have occurred. Um, and so I, I like to illustrate that, that uh, shoreland buffers and shoreland restoration doesn't mean you just have to uh, let things go wild or look unkempt or, 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 or something like that, that they can be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, they can be uh, designed by a landscaper, uh, but those, those two shoreland restorations incorporate uh, native flowers and native plants and uh, they can look quite nice, uh, achieve that silt fence, that buffer sort of thing, and also uh, provide uh, some habitat along the shore. Um, again, uh, Chip touched on this, but this is, is a cross section of, of a typical lake. Um, at the top, you can see we have our, on land, we have our terrestrial plants. Um, and then as you move to the water's edge, we typically have our emergent plants uh, closest to the water's edge. Uh, beyond that, uh, floating plants. Um, you know, things like our, our lily pads, things like that. And then, and then beyond that are our submergent plants. And, and at some point, um, usually uh, determined by our water clarity and how far light penetrates, we get to a depth where plants don't grow anymore. And, and, um, and that's out more in the center of the lake. And, um, and so not a whole lot goes out there, goes on out there where, where plants don't grow in the center of the lake. You, you know, there, there's some activity, you get some predation, particularly if you put a fish crib out there or something, you may get some fish, but, but there's no question that most, uh, most of what goes on in a lake um, is happening in that littoral zone where, where plants grow. And, and, and Chip indicated this, but 90% of all lake life spends, spends uh, at least part of its life cycle, uh, a key part of its life cycle in that littoral zone. And so it's that, it's that shallow water near the shore that really is the most sensitive and important part of our lake in terms of, of lake health. Uh, this graph is just a, a conglomeration of a whole bunch of studies uh, across the country, 
And so there's a wide, wide range in values here, but uh, down the left side uh, are different objectives of a shoreland buffer. So whether it be to control nutrients, uh, control stormwater runoff, fecal bacteria, sediment control, things like that. Um, depending on the soil types, depending on the topography, depending on, on you know, whether you're north facing or south facing, um, a variety of, of variables um, gives you a range of, of shoreland buffer that's required to reach that objective. And that red line there is, is the uh, shoreland zoning ordinance of 35 feet, um, which is, is what the, the, the state asks, asks you to have a 35 foot unmowed buffer uh, along the edge of the water. And you can see there that that 35 feet is really just the tip of the iceberg in, in trying to accomplish any of those objectives. It's, 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 it's really a bare minimum if you wanna have a true effect. Um, again, the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, NR 115, um, it, it states that you should have at least 35 feet of unmowed vegetation along your shoreline. Um, this is something that has been on the books since the 60s. So this isn't, this isn't a newer agenda. It's not new science. This is something we've understood uh, pretty well for over 50 years that, that it was put into law back in the 60s. Um, that said, it, it, it goes, it, it's traditionally been relatively unenforced um, and uh, a lot of people don't understand it or are maybe even aware of it, but it, it is in place and it can get as technical as, as, as you like, um, as you see there on the bottom, but the, the, picture, the, 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 the diagram there on the right, um, I like to show just illustrates the intent of, of the shoreland buffer. And, and that is that you have your, your upland area where, where activities occur, but then you have a good healthy uh, uh, zone there by, before the water's edge of unmowed vegetation. And then that continues into the water with those aquatic plants that are absorbing that nutrient, uh, baffling and protecting against erosion, things like that. Uh, the ordinance allows for access to the lake, a pathway, um, also a view shed uh, through the trees, um, allows for a pier and maybe even a beach area, um, a swimming area, and it allows for you to generally remove plants uh, to, to access open water uh, within about 30 feet of your dock. Um, and so, you know, without getting hung up on the act, all the actual technicalities of it, it's, you know, just understanding uh, that intent and, and how that how that plays into the health of the lake is, is what's important. Again, on the upper left there, just another illustration of a, of a shoreland restoration project uh, using native plants and flowers um, and, and showing how, how that can, how, how that, how that can look. So we survey uh, short, you know, we do a shoreland inventory. Um, again, this is another form of survey, like our fish surveys or anything else, where um, this is this is a way of, of measuring uh, habitat along the shoreline, and we can duplicate this methodology in the future so that we can compare apples to apples and measure change over time. Um, the outer ring of uh, around the lake there, the black and white ring uh, is, is tree canopy. So black is, is tree canopy present, uh, white is, is tree canopy absent. Uh, the inner ring there is, is shows shoreland disturbance. So uh, where it's black, the, it's considered undisturbed shoreline and where it's red, it's considered disturbed shoreline. So when we look at all that, when we look at the uh, you know, 8,300 feet of shoreline that was surveyed, about 56% of that shoreline is considered disturbed in some degree or another. Um, if we look at the, the chart there on the lower left, that disturbance is, is primarily either mowed lawn, um, impervious surface of some sort, uh, riprap, seawall, artificial beach, uh, a variety of things uh, um, go into that disturbance of the shoreline. Of course, where that shoreline is considered disturbed, we, we have a lack of habitat, we have a lack of, 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 of protection of the water quality in, in that area. <clears throat> uh, there were 53 lots at the time of the survey. Uh, those yellow diamonds are all the piers that were measured. Um, for example, uh, the, the pink squares are, are uh, buildings uh, within 35 feet of the shore, whether it be boathouses or, or what have you. So again, just a way of measuring what we have now and being able to look at change over time. 
Uh, the bottom of that chart on the left, uh, coarse woody habitat, again, goes back to the, the fishery, uh, that, that coarse wood, those logs in, in, in the littoral zone are, are what are essential for, for fish and wildlife habitat. Um, that was measured to be about 64 logs per mile, which is uh, actually better than, better than a lot of lakes. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea, you know, a, a pristine lake in this area might be more on the order of 500 logs per mile. Um, and, it, you know, something, something that would be considered uh, healthy and in good shape uh, would be, you know, something at least as much as 250 logs per mile. So this just shows that there's a lot of room for improvement of course woody habitat on this lake. <laughs> Just another example of a, of a shoreland restoration project uh, that, that's uh, down in southeast Wisconsin there. Um, and then this is just a diagram just to, to talk about the importance of native plants when it comes to this, these shoreland buffers. Um, this is a scale diagram of, 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 of actual native species in the area there, uh, both above ground and below ground. And you can see the, the, the depth of root penetration into the ground there with those native plants. Um, some of those plants is reaching as deep as 10 to 14 feet in depth with their roots. Um, these roots, uh, you know, they stabilize the shoreland, they prevent erosion, um, they also extract uh, that nutrient uh, from shallow water and groundwater, uh, keep that phosphorus uh, out of the water column for algae and other aquatic plants. Um, on the top, uh, above the surface, again, these native plants are designed for this climate, so they're, they're relatively robust when it comes to um, acting as that silt fence, whether it be a stormwater runoff or, or snow melt events, things like that. These native plants tend to hold their own a lot better. Um, and uh, for comparison there, that red square on the left is Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, so that's, 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 that's our typical lawn compared to what uh, native plants can achieve. Um, again, this theme of, of reducing runoff, increasing infiltration is, is the name of the game. Um, runoff has that energy that's, that's, that's having adverse impacts on water bodies. So anytime we can slow that runoff, give it a chance to infiltrate, uh, that's going to improve water quality. Uh, so whether it be rain gardens or retention basins, uh, the, the upper left there is a rain garden that was actually constructed. You can actually uh, create a, a low spot filled with rock and, and, and water loving plants uh, for, for that runoff to, to drain to and get a chance to infiltrate. Uh, rain catchment, rain barrels, capturing water from your roof, from your gutters. Um, keeps that water from running off and then you can use it later at drier times to, to water plants. Um, sometimes it's simple, something as simple as having a meandering path to your lake as opposed to a, a straight direct route to your lake um, just to, to direct that water. Um, Ken, Ken's shop, of course, works with uh, one of the big things they do is, is, is work with agriculture, work with producers in the area uh, to improve uh, best management practices on the landscape, uh, things like cover crops and uh, reducing uh, agricultural runoff uh, is a huge thing uh, for protecting our water bodies. And then on the bottom right there, an illustration of how even uh, highway departments and roads get involved. Um, what you don't see there, uh, there's a lake just to the right there. And uh, here we have a highway. Of course, uh, traditionally, we, we've, we've designed water to, to run off our highways and into the closest water body as quickly as possible. And we've realized that that's uh, really not good for our waters. And so, of course, we need to get the water off the roadways for safety issues. But the, again, there are many tools available to uh, here where water is running off the highway into a uh, constructed swale where that, where that runoff gets a chance to infiltrate rather than run directly to the, to the water body. So this just, again, just the tip of the iceberg of some of the tools we have available. 
Aquatic plants, um, again, uh, a very important part of our lake. Um, obviously, they are, uh, they're our source of habitat and shelter. They're also sources of, of food. Um, they, have, they, they, they baffle wave action and prevent erosion um, and um, remove nutrient from the water, things like that. So uh, it's, it's important to have a good, healthy uh, aquatic plant um, community in our, in our lake. Um, and recognize that their benefit. And so we, again, just like everything else, we have a way of surveying these aquatic plants and, and measuring change over time. And so, uh, Tom, this is kind of what you were talking about before. Um, we, can, uh, we have a methodology that we can reproduce over time and, and monitor change. So in Star Lake, uh, we get a grid like this. Um, Star Lake has 188 points. Each one of those points has a GPS coordinate. And so when we go out and do a survey, uh, we navigate to uh, uh, each one of those points on, on, with a, in a boat. And, um, and when we get to that point, we, we drop a rake down. Uh, it's kind of a modified garden rake. And uh, we, we pull it back up and we see what plants are on that rake. And we inventory uh, the abundance of plants on that rake. And then we also inventory the various species on that rake. And, and so again, you could go out and do that survey uh, years later and see how things have changed at each one of those points. So here's a map of rake fullness as a result of that survey in 2018. Uh, rake fullness, as you can see on the right there, is, is a measure of how much uh, the relative abundance of plant material at that location. Uh, if we pull up that rake and it's just heaping full with plants, uh, we give it a three. Uh, if it just has a few sprigs on it, we give it a two or a one, and then if a two, if it's somewhere in between. Um, and in, in a lot of places, we pull it up and there's no plants on that rake, and that get, get, gets a zero. So you can see there, then when we map that out there on the left, um, we have a lot of green dots. So we had a lot of ones uh, in terms of rake fullness around a couple of yellow dots for, um, for twos, and where, where there are uh, points missing, uh, no plant material was pulled up at that location. Um, so real quickly, we can, we can um, illustrate where our, where our abundance of plant growth is on the lake there. Uh, when the survey was done in 2018, uh, 17 different species of aquatic plants were identified in the lake. Um, and uh, in general, um, you know, more species is considered a good thing. Uh, higher biodiversity is, uh, indicates a, a healthy, robust plant community. Um, and so we like to see a lot of, uh, a lot of variety to plants. Um, there is a report that's also available on the website that compares and contrasts all the lakes in the study. So if you want to know how your lake compares in a particular area, whether that be its phosphorus concentration or its water clarity or its uh, aquatic plant species, you can see how it, how it falls out. And so that, that chart there on the bottom left is, 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 a, is a chart from that report. And so you can see where, where Star Lake kind of falls out uh, just, just below uh, center there in terms of number of aquatic plant species compared to other lakes that have been in the survey. So uh, 17 plant species is a little less than, than average uh, for lakes in the, in the area. Um, and you can see our species listed there um, in that table. On the right side of that table, you see C value. And so each species uh, gets a C value. And that's the, the C value is the relative uh, sensitivity or um, uh, quality of that plant. And so not all plants are created equal, if you will. Um, some, some plants are very tolerant of disturbance and they're considered lower quality plants. Um, so uh, it's not just about how much plants you have in your lake, but what types of plants and, and what, what level of quality plants they are. Um, the C value ranges from zero to 10. So a 10 is a high quality plant. Uh, so you can see we have a floating leaf burr reed there near the bottom, that's a 10. Uh, so anytime you have a nines and tens in your, in your species list, that's a 
that's a good indication of, of, of lake health. Um, we also had aquatic moss there uh, at the bottom, which gets a zero. So that's that's a sign of something not as valuable. Um, most of the, most of those species uh, in this lake fall, you know, between five and eight. So those are, um, you know, they are they are what they are there. Uh, so again, when we do this survey in the future, we can monitor not only has how has plant abundance changed, but how has the how is the quality of the plants uh, maybe changed over time? And as I always say, a good plant biologist can tell you more about the quality of a lake than I can with all my lab samples, um, just based on that species assemblage there. But anytime you see a 10, that's, that's a good sign. And you got a few eights in there too. So this is on a relatively healthy lake, uh, despite having uh, fewer species. The most common species uh, found during the survey were slender naiad at about three quarters of the sites. Uh, stiff pondweed and flat stem pondweed uh, came in at, at a lot fewer of the sites. Um, so slender naiad is a, is a it's an average plant. Um, you know nothing nothing too significant. We did have the 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 C value the the floating leaf burr reed there, but um, probably didn't occur too frequently. So that's where the, the map there shows you where the slender naiad of a six was located. Um, and then that's our stiff pondweed and our flat stem pondweed. Invasive species, uh, curly leaf, oh, that's from Musil Lake. That's not right. Does, uh, sorry about that. Does Star Lake have any invasives? Let me see here. Doesn't look like any invasives were found during the survey. Um, so that's a wrong slide there, but shouldn't have been in there. Um, but what what is what has been uh, the invasive species that are documented for Star Lake are the banded mystery snail and ornamental water lilies. And so um, these are obviously they're not as, as famous or as detrimental as Eurasian water milfoil, which fortunately uh, hasn't been observed. But uh, banded mystery snail is present. Um, and uh, don't know a whole lot. Of, we don't know a whole lot about the snail. Uh, it obviously displaces uh, native species, but doesn't typically become a significant problem. Um, ornamental water lilies uh, probably are a nuisance, and uh, they can definitely uh, take over and, and, and choke out um, native species, and uh, don't provide quite the, the as quality habitat as uh, as a native species would. Recreation on the lake, it's, it's a no-wake lake, so you've, uh, typically any, any lake under 50 acres uh, in the state is no-wake. Um, you're, you're closer to 60 acres on Star Lake, but um, uh, also a no-wake lake, I think since 2000 or something like that. So your local municipality uh, basically establishes the rules uh, in terms of wake and speeds and things on the lake, and so um, at some point they decided that Star Lake was not big enough. Uh, it, I would probably agree with that, probably not big enough for wake speeds. So it's in no wake on Star Lake and the boat launch is owned by the town of Doty. Um, boat launches in, in Ocano County can be either owned by the Forest Service or the county or the local municipality, a variety of different entities. So it's, it's important to know who, who owns and maintains your boat launch if it needs improvement or attention. Uh, and just to wrap up, any other comments? What do you think should be done to improve Star Lake? Uh, remove the muck uh, was the one comment I had there. Um, uh, we can talk about that if you like, but as I was describing before, you know, the accumulation of muck is part of the natural aging process, and there's really not a practical way to remove muck from a lake. Um, uh, Dredging is, is, is very hard to permit and um, is rarely has, has a, a very good effect. You know, you could, you could dredge in front of one property, but that, that stuff just kind of slumps back in and it's really not practical to remove uh, large quantities of muck. Um, there's also a lot of stuff on the market out there in terms of, uh, uh, you know, pellets or, or, or things you can put into the water to remove muck. And uh, really, none of those have have ever been shown to be uh, proven or, or effective. We don't we don't recommend those in general. 
Uh, Ryan, this, yeah. Ryan, this is Tom Morgan again. You bet. Uh, that has been tried on the lake in a few places where they removed the muck and they did the suction thing and the works. Okay. And they got to stay on top of it, obviously. Yeah. Uh, there's some sand, obviously, where people want to, you know, maintain it, but they really have to work at it. The, the muck is here to stay. I can tell people that. The other question I have is you were talking about the shorelines and restoring the 35 foot buffer with the aquatic or the, uh -huh. the plant that, that who do we talk to about if we were to come up with an organization, who could we talk to about obtaining those type of plants? Uh, Ken may have a comment here, but your, your best place to start is, is with someone like Ken. There's a lot of resources, but uh, Ken's shop has, has probably your most local resources in terms of uh, 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 funding assistance and, and consultation and some stuff like that. Yeah, I guess I could jump in here for a second. Um, that county cost share program I showed you on the website there, uh, we get $20,000 every year. Um, it's 70% cost sharing up to $2,500 of cost sharing dollars turns out to about $3,600 total project, which that's a pretty extensive project. Um, uh, that's for shoreline restoration, erosion, uh, you name it, rain gardens. Uh, and I, one misconception here a lot of times is when you say the 35 foot buffer, we'll take 35 feet, we'll take more. But a lot of times it might be just 300 square feet on one corner and on the other corner, another 300 or something. It, it isn't necessarily... 35 feet straight across the whole thing. So sure. there, there's a lot of things we can do. And, um, but you just call our office and we come out and do a little site inventory of your property and give some recommendations and go from there. Yeah, it's a good point. It's not all or nothing. You know, it can be one part of your property. Um, you know, every, every little bit helps. And so it, it, um, you know, whatever, whatever you're willing to do and, and, and work on is, is definitely eligible. Okay. Thank you. And this is uh, Brenda with the DNR. We also have a similar program as well, a, a grant program that pays for a number of practices, um, like Ken mentioned, rain gardens and, and native shoreline plantings and rock diversions and infiltration practices and um, even the fish sticks too. Um, the deadline for that is November 1st and we, we operate the same way. We'll come out to your lake and take a look for, for placement and, and recommendations as well. And, and they can both be used together. So if you obtain um, money from the county that can be used towards cost share for, for DNR grants as well. Thank you. And that's, that's available to individual uh, landowners too, so that you wouldn't have to necessarily be a, an association to receive that money. You know, in each, each landowner can, can go about that as well. Um, obviously there's, there's some, competitiveness and momentum uh, when you when you get a group of together but um, uh, yeah <clears throat> um, yeah so that with that any other questions here's here's contact information for Ken uh, Dale and I and then of course uh, chip and Brenda can be can be found at the DNR um, if, if you have any questions beyond today um, again just to say again what what I'll do is, is, is start a draft of your management plan and send that out to you all and, um, and then just uh, look to receive comments on it. And so uh, again, I've had, I've had some groups get together, uh, people get together to go over it, maybe form a committee. Um, other times I just get comments and responses from individuals, um, things like that. I'll, I'll also get Brenda and Chip and folks to, to comment on, on what we draft up. And so uh, we will just kind of go through that iterative process until uh, people are all generally on board with, with what's on there. Um, and then we'll get it submitted. So look for that in the coming weeks. And um, definitely reach out to any of us if you wanna discuss something or have questions. And any other any other comments, questions anyone might have? Oh, I appreciate it. And as always, you know, we thank the volunteers for the you know folks who are on the boat with us doing the surveys and your time here tonight is definitely appreciated. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you folks. Have a good evening and uh, we'll be talking to you in the coming weeks. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. I know.